Welcome back, everybody. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome 2018 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine, Tasuko Honjo, to speak on serendipities of acquired immunity. Thank you very much for joining today. The title of my talk is the identical what I spoke in Stockholm last December. But the, obviously, because of the time limitation, I trimmed it a lot. The immune surveillance against cancer has been proposed by Sir McFarren Burnett, 1970. And this hypothesis gained a lot of support, including the cancer incidence increase after long-term immune suppressor for organ transplant patient. However, numerous attempts to develop immunotherapy were unsuccessful. This could be, by many reasons, the most important three all these attempts, cancer vaccine, in vitro activation, T lymphocytes, cytokine treatment, including gamma interferon, IL-2, IL-12, all these were attempt to push the axel of the, our immune system. And unfortunately, people didn't realize there is another regulatory mechanism in the immune system that is a break. The first molecule which control immune system was discovered by Per Goldstein, although he identified cDNA, he didn't know that is the immune negative regulator. Around the, sorry, around the 19, 1994-5, several people, Takmak, uh, Bluestone, Alan Sharp, and Jim Allison, and several others, almost simultaneously showed CTL4 is a negative regulator of immune system. And 1966, Jim Allison first demonstrated blocking CTL4 can block the growth of tumor cell in animal model. We identified the PD-1 1992 without knowing its negative regulator of immune system, but our long effort finally reached the conclusion that PD-1 is negative regulator of immune system. Without PD-1, animal get lots of autoimmune diseases, depending on their genetic background. Based on these findings, we thought this can be a useful target to activate immune system and use for the treatment of cancer. In collaboration with Dr. Minato in Kyoto University, we first demonstrated, compared with the rat IgG as a control, anti-PD-L1, that the ligand for PD-1 receptor can slow down the growth of the tumor and also prolong the lifespan of the tumor-bearing mice. Based on these findings, we persuaded, finally, after long struggle, pharmaceutical industry to invest, and they reached the conclusion, compared with a typical chemotherapy drug, Dacabazine and Nivolumab, that the Bristol-Myers anti-PD-1 antibody shows a very clear difference for the survival of melanoma patient. Based on numerous number of clinical trials, the FDA and also 
Japanese uh, PMDA, and also in Europe, all over the world, currently approved this treatment for over a dozen different cancers. This includes melanoma, lung cancer, renal cancer, and most importantly, they approved all highly mutated cancers, regardless of origin of organs. This treatment are currently thought the paradigm shift of cancer therapy. The reason is first, it causes less adverse effects because normal cells are not affected in theory. Secondly, it can be used a wide variety of tumors. More than 1,000 clinical trials are going on currently, or even more. And thirdly, the effect is durable. Patients who responded continued to tumorless even after the treatment was stopped. Over five years survival are recorded. Why this is so effective? We learned tumor cell continue to mutate, and chemotherapy can often select resistant cell because tumor cell continue to mutate their genome and resistance lines are selected out. If the doctor changed the medicine, again, another resistance cells grow. And fortunately, our immune system that includes acquired immunity and which can pinpoint every single mutation in theory can pick up all these mutant cells, including original tumor cells, as non-self. And therefore, immune system can attack tumors if they can release from the break that we, know, we don't know exactly how this immune suppression took place. And currently, more than 1,000 combinatorial therapy is underway. The major effort is to improve the efficacy of immunotherapy using anti-PD-1 plus CDL4, chemo, radiotherapy, anti-angiogenesis agent, and also chemoradiotherapy, and many others. The outcome of this clinical trial will gradually revealed in a few years. And future, what I hope is gradually the proportion of the patient treated by immunotherapy will grow and more and more patients are first line treatment by immunotherapy. Currently, most of cases either second or third line. And I have a very optimistic view or hope in future, majority of the patients, cancer patients, are treated. And if, even if we may not be able to completely eliminate the tumors, but we may be able to coexist with tumor. If we are old enough, it won't be any serious problem, even we have some tumor in our body. The other problem, not only efficacy, is side effects. And actually, PD-1 deficiency is not that simple. Recently, Dr. Sidonia Fagalason in Riken, Yokohama, published very interesting but striking observation. The PD-1 deficiency causes enormous expansion of T-cell 
as we found 1999, not only that, it causes enormous consumption of metabolites in blood, and that will clearly see the shift of metabolites, and that affects critical neurotransmitter like dopamine or serotonin, and resulting in the change of the behavior, or the, I don't know what, but critical change happens in the brain function. And also, we know gut bacterial change because of PD-1 deficiency. Dr. Fagerson group showed taking the blood and compared it with normal mice, wild type, they show very big difference in tryptophan metabolism and TCA or mitochondrial related metabolites. And these change is so significant that as I said, their circulation, the brain take up all the amino acid to make their neurotransmitter and they become shortage. This reflects enormous activation of mitochondria in T lymphocytes. And PD-1 deficiency, they also show disturbed gut microbiota because PD-1 deficiency has a problem of IgA production. IgA normally coat bacterial surface and important for maintenance of the good bacteria. As you can see, IgA coated bacteria is significantly less compared to wild type and actual bacterial spectrum in the gut of the PD-1 deficient animal change. Most drastically, excuse me, most drastically enterobacter are enormously shifted in the PD-1 deficient animals. And this not only seen, but earlier, actually Ferguson showed immune deficiency linked with gut microbiome distribution back 2002. She is the first showed this interaction, microbiome expansion, especially strange microbiome called filamentous, uh, segmentous, segmented filamentous bacteria expands in AID deficient animal, which is required for IgA production. So IgA is essential for maintaining the bacteria. And strikingly, in the absence of AID deficiency, uh, sorry, IgA caused by AID deficiency activate host immune system like all these uh, tumor-like nodal is because of the lymph node stimulated by bacteria and expanded. And also spleen is much larger compared to wild type. And how this happens? And PD-1 AID are my favorite molecules, and I wondered whether PD-1 deficiency showing the anti-tumor activity, whether AID deficiency also show the same phenotype. And recently, my uh, young student compared wild type and AID deficiency and tumor growth is certainly reduced, just like PD-1 deficiency. In addition, if you compare this uh, aged wild type, which are treated anti-PD-1, they do not respond anti-PD-1 treatment and just grow. However, young wild type mouse respond to anti-PD-1 treatment and 
the size of the tumor is less. More strikingly, aged PDAID deficient animals shows a complete suppression of tumor. So not only PD-1 deficiency, but also AID deficiency, both are required for IgA production, can show hyperactivated immune response against the tumor. Most excitingly, if we put these animals into germ-free without gut bacteria, this striking effect of AID deficiency disappear. So this query tells us microbiota in the gut is activating our immune system and that maintain our metabolite IgA production and all these immune system. And this is also important to control homeostasis of our body, <coughs> including the brain system. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> if uh, these two molecules collaborate in lymph node around the gut and communicate to produce the best IgA. In the absence of either AID or PD-1, this whole system is screwed up and in the absence of IgA, gut microbiota skewed and that will cause enhanced anti-tumor activity and even affects our nervous system and causing emotional change. So I have to connect this talk to aging. <laughs> aging occurs at the cellular level, DNA, proteins, maybe cell death, but aging occurs organs like brain function, damaged, dementia, like Alzheimer or Parkinson or many others. But most importantly, I think aging of the whole body, that immune system plays the most important role. We know by aging, immune system quickly drops just so you saw the activity against tumor is pretty much damaged by aging. All these depends on our acquired immunity, which we get sometime during the vertebrate evolution. Acquired immunity evolved as a defense system against the pathogens. Consequently, our lifespan extremely prolonged. And it was very fortunate, without expectation, cancer cell accumulate mutation and express neoantigen, which can be also recognized by our acquired immunity, which is very fortunate. I'd like to thank our collaborators. This is a picture soon after I heard a telephone call from Stockholm and our long-term collaborators and the numerous collaborators abroad. And I also thank the generous support from our government and many other funding agencies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Honjo. And perhaps you. you'd stay on stage with me now yes. because we're now going to move into our final panel discussion. <coughs> Just if you step away, they're going to put the chairs here. Perhaps come a little, sorry, if you, thank you. Why, 
So why don't you take this seat here, if okay. I may? <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. So it's become a bit of a tradition at our Nobel Prize Dialogues that we end the day. Please do take a seat, please. Um, uh, we, we, we end the day by bringing our, all our laureates together for one final light-hearted discussion panel. <clears throat> and I would therefore like to invite all our laureates on stage, please. Please give them a round of applause. Randy, would you like to go at the end? Tim, next to Randy. Angus, if you'd like to go here. Thank you. Liz, do you want to sit here? Okay. Angus, if you'd like to sit there. Yes, that's okay. Great. So this session, welcome all. This session is rather frighteningly entitled, What Can We Say About the Future? Uh, we could just say that Brexit is likely to happen, unfortunately, <laughs> and leave it at that. Or we could try and be a bit more positive. Um, I, would, uh, I think we should at least start in the realm of ageing, since that's what the meeting is about. Is. So, Liz, let's start with you. You're next Liz. to me. What can we say about the future of ageing? <laughs> well, I'm going to say what I hope and aspire the future of ageing will be like. Because you have to know what to hope for in order to make things happen. So let's say, what, what would we like? So I would say, what would I like to see? I'd like to see that while we're ageing, as we know this is going to happen with demographies, we're going to go through you know, a lot of um, growth in the demographic of people who are old. But instead of counting their chronological years, we're going to be dealing with the fact that there are physical infirmities, preventing them and handling them through all sorts of you know, useful technological ways, and we're going to be seeing people now looking at that aging period instead of as a retirement where you stop doing things, where you're actually starting to really stay engaged in ways that you didn't before. And that will be evolving in a continuous way as we age. There won't be a sudden, I'm working, I'm retiring, and therefore I'm doing something different. It'll really evolve, so we'll stay extremely engaged and I think very productively engaged. So the aging demographic will be an asset rather than you know, what we always say is a burden. So that's what I see as we should aspire to that. I think that's very doable and uh, that's where I see it. Lovely, an opportunity, not a problem. Lovely. Randy, can I shoot straight down to the end of the line? You can, you can concentrate on your <laughs> Parkinson's disease sure, sure, subject, or sure. you can go no. more broadly. So I'm, um, I'm a reductionist. I firmly believe in trying to understand how things work by understanding their mechanism. And so I'm going to make some very specific predictions pertinent to the Parkinson's disease. The first is, I think in the next 10 years, we will have a, uh, an effective way of monitoring the earliest stages of the disease. And I'll give you one very concrete example of where progress, I believe, can be made. I mentioned this um, um, pathological feature of the cells in the brain that make dopamine that is a accompanies the disease. Unfortunately, that structure, the Lewy body, can only be seen in uh, brain biopsies of deceased patients. But I believe in the next 10 years we will have um, non-invasive procedures to diagnose their presence and that we will be able to see them in people long before the disease um, progresses to pathology. And that will be valuable because, as I said, if you can figure out a way to intervene early, then you can block progression of the disease. So I think the next 10 years we'll see that breakthrough. I also believe that we'll understand at a more fundamental level why the dopaminergic neurons die. And if we can pinpoint that, then I think chemo chemotherapeutic agents will be developed that will arrest that death. And I also, I'll take an even bold, bolder step and predict that we'll understand how the Lewy body that is limited to the dopaminergic neurons, how it invades other areas of the brain. 
And then if we understand how that works, then again, maybe we can devise some intervention to block that. Thank you. So you can hold me to that. We'll be back here in 10 years, we, and you can remind me of that. <laughs> we will. We will. Three lovely research challenges. How confident are you in making predictions in the future? Well, of course, not at all. But, uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, my favorite example that, that I say what, state when I'm asked about this is, who would have predicted CRISPR would advance from a microbiological phenomenon of curiosity but no obvious practical application to the enormous tool that it now is or will be on the basis of work that's just been done in the last less than 10 years. No one, no one in their right mind would have predicted that. So there will be, there will be even more spectacular discoveries beyond the three that I hope we have that, that we'll be able to review 10 years from now. Fantastic. Well, Tim, we've gone from the societal to the cellular, so you can go anywhere you like now. Well, I mean, I think it's really important to understand that we don't know what we don't know. And that's where discoveries are made. Wandering around, just keeping your eyes open, thinking about them, and stumbling on things by accident. And that's the name of the game. I think it's probably the game we're all, we've all been in. Shells on the beach. Shells on the beach, exactly <laughs> so. Um, I'd like to say one thing about aging. I mean, I've been at death's door twice now in my life, and I'm very grateful that I'm still alive. I've been alive now five years longer than my dad, who died of something that almost killed me. And that's thanks to medical advances. So I, think, I used to think it was just a matter of eating well and you know, living cleanly and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, but it isn't, actually. I'm, I, owe my, I owe my life to drugs and doctors. So I'd like to raise a toast to them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Professor Honjo. OK, so one thing we have to make it sure, we have to die someday. Quite so. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> depends. Don't, on, don't, depends. No depends. one would disagree. Yeah. So the, the important point is uh, how we can see or expect our death. You know, that's most important. We have to have good education for the public. The most important thing is how happily we can die. This is one thing I want to say. Mm -hmm. and the next thing is we have enormous diversity in our genome. So there are enormous variation in our lifespan. And thirdly, our knowledge in biology is very limited, as Tim said. And the, especially, we had lots of knowledge about the molecules. But as a physiology, as a whole, regulation, I just try to say, immune system appear to control many things, including nervous system, but still, we have very limited knowledge. Yeah. So I, I don't have very clear picture, but that's all I can <laughs> <Many> say. Many mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point about dying is very interesting. It's still very much a taboo subject. People yes. do not want to think about exactly. it. Exactly. I think that's not a good idea. We have to anticipate how we can, you know, accept death and uh, we just uh, plan, you know, to avoid the cancer is one thing, to live happily, mm -hmm. to avoid the diabetes, another. So we have to plan as much as we can. That's all I can say. Well, I don't know. Actually, I now remember a third time when I almost died. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> in this case, it was a lamb chop. OK. And I, I almost choked to death. And as I was sort of realizing what was going on, I thought, what a stupid way to die. Yeah. And I thought it was rather funny, actually. <laughs> but I was very grateful when I came back, again. Came yes. back to life. Well, what a miracle you're here. <laughs> it is. Oh, lovely. Um, uh, Angus, we've stepped back into society again, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, lots of interesting things I've heard. Um, so let's just go back to thinking about the future. Um, I think we're in a bad place right now. Um, but I'm also a great believer in progress. Um, Lars said this morning that um, Nobel was a creature 
of the Enlightenment. And ever since the Enlightenment, we find a way of making long-run progress on almost all fronts, even if there are lots of short-run setbacks. So bad things happen for a while, but the force of reason ultimately, I think, brings us through. So I think we are in a bad place right now, both politically, um, economically, and that the system, like capitalism, that has served us very well is not functioning very well right now. And that's going to take changes, and you hope that it won't run off the rails as badly as it did in the 1930s, for example. But I think there are real threats there. On the more micro level, I also think, I love Liz's vision of aging, of something that's properly integrated into society, and there's not the elderly and the young, there's just people. Um, I think there will be a lot of progress. Um, I want to disagree a little bit um, with Tim, because I think that um, we have a concept in economics called directed technical progress. Um, and what Tim says is clearly right, that stumbling and serendipitous Serendipity is incredibly important for scientific discovery because you can't program it. On the other hand, history teaches us that when there's a need for something, quite frequently the solution becomes apparent, often through serendipity. So it's not entirely contradictory. And obviously it doesn't always work. I mean, when Nixon declared the war on cancer... Well, he solved AIDS, actually. Yeah, well... Which is interesting. <laughs> So, you know, but, but it's also true that the, the stuff that Randy has talked about, this progressive neurological diseases, there was no incentive to look at those historically because so few people ever got to the age where these things manifested themselves. So that people worked on things like um, the germ theory of disease, which saved millions of lives of very young people. Then once babies and young people don't, die anymore, you can move on to looking at things like heart disease and antihypertensives and things. And we've sort of done that. Um, cancer is doing pretty well right now. Um, and then we're moving on to these. But there was no incentive, and now there's real need for it. Now, that doesn't mean five minutes from now we're going to get a solution. Um, these are really hard problems and so on. But there was no resources devoted to them. There was no incentives. And I think history teaches us that when we need something, we're much more likely to find it than when we don't know that we need it. I'd, I'd love for you to discuss this a little bit, just for a couple of minutes, this, this idea, because you use the word directed, and it's, uh, that's, if, if, in some ways, that's a kind of, it's a bad word for many scientists. Um, Mandy's nodding. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, at the outset of my career, I, I wanted independence to pursue my own curiosity, and I treasured that opportunity to do something with no possible practical benefit that I could conceive of. But um, I found in my case, and I find in many other cases, that when you make a discovery of some fundamental nature, there are practical people out there who will, who will use it. And now I've found, as I've advanced in my life and I have other opportunities that have presented themselves, I think um, I've learned enough to know that, um, that it is possible to focus on a goal and to try to uh, reach a particular goal. Um, and that's the opportunity that I've been given now, and uh, I intend to seize it. So it's <laughs> well, a it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Huh? Yeah. yeah. It's a benefit of aging, to be <laughs> older and wiser. <laughs> <laughs> but I think both of you are making a point that... Uh, I'll just take the example of um, doing research in telomeres, and then my colleagues at UCSF came to me, and they said, well, wouldn't you like to do uh, research related to cancer? And so, so I chose an area of research which came from our very basic research in model organisms and started applying it to cancer cells. And in a way, the justification was to say, well, I want to use this as a, you know, as a treatment for cancers. But I always also said, 
whatever we're doing, we're going to learn something along the way. And even though there is not a miracle cure that, you know, at the moment relies on what we were doing with that goal, we still learned an awful lot going along the way. So I think you can have a mission and sort of understand that with the complexity of aging, you will learn so many valuable things that just in the course of doing something with a mission, even if the mission itself didn't get met as you thought it would, I bet really interesting things are going to come out, and I think that's what you're implying, that you don't know what they'll be. But even from these very goal-directed things, Randy, I bet you're going to find out amazingly interesting things that were not exactly the question that was asked, but just by doing it, really interesting answers came out that in the end will bear on, on, that, on that same question. I mean, I still think this is a great way of killing cancer cells, which is to make them make mutated telomeres, but there was this little problem that our normal cells like telomerase too, so you had to be able to direct that weapon very specifically to cancer cells, and so that's, that's the holdup right now. But we learned an awful lot just even trying that approach. Thank you. Angus. Uh, Adam said that direction can be a dirty word, and I think that's right. But a lot of the direction is very distant, and it might not even be human. So, I mean, you think of people, say, engineers who are working for a corporation or they're working in, for General Electric or GM or something, then they have all sorts of ideas. They have new ways of trying things and so on. And those are filtered through the price system. So the price system says, you know, this is going to be profitable. No, don't follow that because that's not going to be profitable at all. And where does the price system come from? The price system responds to needs. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a feedback loop um, which is actually filtering out the creation of technical progress. Even though the engineers who are doing this, if you ask them, how did you find that out? And they said, I was looking for something else. I fell over this. Mm -hmm. It's purely yeah. serendipitous. Mm -hmm. No one was directing me at all. You know, it wasn't a directive from the National Institutes of Health that said you should do this. On the other hand, you know, the National Institutes of Health can sometimes direct people in very positive mm -hmm. ways. I mean, we were um, talking today about, to Sarah about a friend of ours, Richard Sussman, at the National Institutes of Health, mm -hmm. who um, was a sponsor to a lot of us. And I would never have started working on health. Anne would never have started working on health. A whole bunch of economists would never have started working on health if he hadn't come and knocked on our door and said, we can give you mm. some money, you know, if you work on this. And we said, well, I gotta work on something. <laughs> you know, um, this is as yeah. good as anything. So, you know, that sort of direction, which is not heavy handed, um, is, you know, it can be very productive. I Thank think you. it's a really great mixture, though, and I, I just want to, I know Richard, I remember Richard Sol Sussman as well, and this mixture of directing and not, and another great thing from the National Institutes of Health, I remember hearing the person who used to direct all of the external funding of basic research outside the NIH, and he was talking to us just within the confines of NIH at a council meeting, but he said, you know, the whole point was of NIH funding, we would give you a researcher funding, and our, our sort of word, our blessing to you was, take the money and run, <laughs> which was saying, go with where the science was going. But this was in the Institute of Aging, so they understood, you know, that that was, you had a goal, but you could also um, really do research if you let people let their creativity run wild. You know, no one ever gives money to NIH researchers who are doing basic science and doesn't see that money used. I mean, scientists really want to get the science done. And, uh, and, and I think that's where we're going to find out things about aging too that, you know, we didn't know, but we're going to have to, so my future ideal world will have come about because we've let people continue to do research on these really open questions. That's okay. Yeah, so I generally accept the necessity is the mother of the discovery, but that's more directly applied to physics, engineering, maybe chemistry, but in biology, we cannot design any strategy to reach the goal. Most of the finding in biology is serendipity or some accidental finding because there are so much unknown factors. I think the physics is a science of atoms. It's a limited number. 
chemistry compounds, again, limit number. But biology, we have 10 to 13 cells in our body, and each cell differ. And the genes, only limited number, but the product is enormously amplified. Yep. So all together, how much diversity and the complexity we have, we still don't know. It's a fantastic point, but on the other hand, we have four biologists on a panel of five people, so maybe there's a, maybe there's a waiting factor here. Um, we're running out of time, and I just wanted to finish. That was an important discussion, very interesting. Thank you very much. I just wanted to finish the silly question, perhaps. But thinking about your own futures, what can you say about your own futures? How long do you want to live? <laughs> <laughs> Randy first, we'll come well, down I, the line. I, have, I now have an obligation to live at least 10 years <laughs> to come back here and tell you how we succeeded on those three goals. That'll do. I think I only have to live four, which is the <coughs> ten degree of tenure of my wife. <laughs> No, you have to have many... But I mean, as long as they're having fun, it's yes. great. But should my knees give out, I would think twice. <laughs> but then I can get a new knee. You can yeah. get a new knee. You need more <laughs> near-death experiences to tell us about yeah. anyway, so. Thank you. So the number will increase according to my age. But at this point, <laughs> 120. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Anne and I have just finished the first draft of a book, and I'd like to live to see it come out. I, I have a very good friend who's also a Nobel laureate, Danny Kahneman. Um, and Danny, for years, has been telling me that he has no idea why he's alive, and he thinks life is a bore, and there's no oh point my. to it at all. Oh so he's writing another book, and I saw him the other day, and I said, do you still prefer to be dead? And he said, no. And ah. I said, well, that's great. You should keep on writing. He said, yeah, but I'd like to be dead before the reviews come out. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Excellent. Okay, last word goes to you, Liz. Well, I, I think as long as I think I have a purpose that I feel is meaningful, I want to keep, I want to keep living, yeah. But on, on the other hand, I do want to keep enjoying it, too. So purpose with enjoyment. And if that goes, then I don't care if I go. That sounds like <laughs> the secret of happy long life. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. Uh, thank you to the audience. And that's it from us. Now just to the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to the closing remarks. Mrs. Laura Sprushman, acting CEO of Nobel Media, please. Your Excellencies, Dear laureates, ladies and gentlemen, friends. It may not come as a surprise that Nobel laureates are happy to speak about aging. In a way, we can blame Nobel laureates for the fact that we are living longer. Or we can thank Nobel laureates for it. Without Alexander Fleming, who found the healing effect of penicillin, many of us would have died in an infection. Without the electrocardiogram discovered by Wilhelm Eindhoven, some heart failures would have, le would have had led to early death. Without the work of Nobel laureates Branting and Magliod, who discovered insulin, many diabetics would have died young not to mention Tatsuko Honjo and Jim Allison, 
whose groundbreaking work on immunotherapy has helped numerous people to survive cancer, as we just heard. These were just some of the Nobel Prize awarded discoveries that have made our lives longer. It doesn't stop there. We shouldn't forget all the peace laureates who dedicated their lives to save people getting killed in armed conflicts. All the Nobel Prize awarded institutions, such as the United Nations, the Doctors Without Borders, or the Red Cross, who protect lives, human rights, and democracy. Getting older is a privilege. Let's not forget that it's not obvious to make it to that stage in life. There are many who've, who have put their lives into making our lives longer and healthier. As Einstein put it in one of his famous quotes as an advice to young people, never lose your curiosity. This is what we have seen today, a colorful display of Nobel laureate's curiosity and creativity. In other words, a display of their youth. I would like to thank our distinguished Nobel laureates and speakers for opening our minds today. A warm thanks to JSPS, President Susumu Satomi, and his great team for this collaboration. And to our Nobel International Partners, ABB, Ericsson, 3M, Scania, and Volvo Cars, for making this possible. Thanks to Ambassador Magnus Robach and the Embassy of Sweden. To my wonderful colleagues at Nobel Media, Lena Abramsson, who is the director of events, who have made all this come to life. And thank you, Adam Smith, for taking us through this day and for composing the program. To all of you, thank you so much for being here today, and I hope to see you again very soon. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you.